So, in previous class we started to talk about uh, diffusion in a very disordered material. We talked about the continuous time random walk, and I briefly explained some experiments done in uh, disordered semiconductors, these time of flight experiments that were analyzed by Sharon Montrell. You flash, if you remember, you flash some light on a semiconductor that has a lot of doping, a lot of disorder in it, a very messy material. And then uh, the transport is sh shown to, to be anomalous, which means that the drift is not proportional to time, but rather to some time, to some power alpha. This is a, was a big uh, revolution in uh, the theory of transport in general and diffusion, because it showed that the uh, central limit theorem arguments and usual transport and diffusion are simply not valid. So. Today we are going to continue with this a little bit and we are going to analyze the continuous time random walk, show how it's related to Levy statistics, find the propagator itself, while previous class we just talked about the moments. Uh, the propagator is important because moments, many models can give you first moment which behaves like t to some power alpha. So to distinguish between, mom between models, you need to know the full shape of the distribution of spreading of particles. So it, 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 even in principle, if you have, a, for example, if you have a variance that goes like t to some power alpha, let's say alpha is equal half, it doesn't mean that the shape of the propagator, the packet itself, is not Gaussian. It could be Gaussian with anomalous spreading. So people were very much interested in the how does the propagator look. But before doing that, uh, a more mathematical uh, aspect of the problem, I want to discuss more uh, the, the di fundamental difference between quench disorder and anneal disorder. And this many times is also called mean field approximation. This is going to be what we called previously continuous time random walk. So the idea, the idea is the following. What is quench? Quench means that you have a sample, and in it you have a particle. And the particle is moving in the sample, and it, it sees some random energy landscape. The, the, the potential field, the forces are random because you go in somewhere in space, uh, next day I go to next to the Leo, or I'm repelled, and then I go next to this guy, I'm attracted. Or, so there is a random field inside the uh, material, and this is because in the material you have all kinds of junk. It's, it's not a clean material. It's not a, uh, th 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 these, these uh, defects can be simply w a few atoms that are missing in the, in the generally speaking, a lattice. It can be many things. So quenched means, quenched disorder means that the disorder is fixed and doesn't change in time. So you, you, for example, you take a semiconductor, you prepare it at high temperature, then you quickly cool it. That is actually the, what you people mean by quench. You take something, a material from high temperature, and then you cool it very fast, it solidifies. And it, because you did it very quickly, you have a defects. And this, most materials are like that. They are very disordered. Many materials are like that. I mean, if I take this wood or I take something without preparing it very carefully, it will be a very disordered material. And of course, in quantum mechanics, many people in transport and condensed matter, many people are dealing with this problem that you know, the electrons, for example, are scattered by some events. The scattering is the random aspect of the problem. So we are, we are dealing with an extreme case where this uh, randomness, this quenched Fix this order. Uh, a doesn't change in time, and B uh, creates a, a diffusion or a transport that goes like t to the alpha. In our case, alpha is less than one. And if there is a field, this is when the field is zero. And if there is a field, and by field I mean an addition to the local disorder, which is also a field. You have an external field, which is constant. Then you drive the system, and then you have the mean is not zero, and then you have t to two alpha. So 
Once you have alpha less than one, then we, we, from a measurement point of view, we say, oh, this, this system is very disordered. Because if it would be a clean system, we would have your alpha equal one. So this is, of course, an experimental point of view. Now, we have in mind the quench um, disorder. So I'm going to discuss a specific quench disorder, which is the trap model, which falls into this one. So I'm going to talk about the quench trap model which I mentioned it already previous class. So the idea here is the following. I have some potential energy and I have traps. So this is the random energy landscape. There are many approximations already in this type of figure. One of them is that the distance between the traps is more or less the same. Another one is I do not consider barriers. Barriers are something that go up here and there around them. So this is already approximation. There are many, many different types of random disorders and many people have investigated different models. Many of them give similar results. Similar results, I mean, anomalous diffusion. But the details are always very different. So what I mean by this is this is a random energy landscape. And at time t equals 0, I prepare this random energy landscape. And that's it. it this does not change in time. This is the meaning of quenched. What we said here is that we have here some energies, these are potential energies, and these are the depths of the traps. And we have here different sites, so this is site number I, and here we have a, another depth, and this guy is the deepest in this figure. So this is the, at, at zero temperature, if this is a finite system, at zero temperature the particle will be found here, because it goes to the lowest energy of the, of the system. Again, temperature T equals zero. What we said is that we have a PDF of these E's, these energies, and this one went like a 1 over Tg. Tg was from the glass temperature minus E over Tg. So the distribution of the, the traps, the, these traps have an exponential distribution. It, it means that the mean how deep these traps are on average is simply Tg. Then we got that alpha is equal T over Tg. This is when alpha is less than 1. So this alpha is T over Tg when alpha is less than 1. So what we have, we have the MSD, for example, the mean square displacement. This is CTRW theory. It goes like this. It goes like t, or t to the alpha. And this is when t is less than tg. And this is for when t is bigger than tg. So either you are normal or you are anomalous, depending on the temperature. And what we argued was that it takes time to escape from these barriers. And this was simply something called Arrhenius or Boltzmann's law, that the time inside here was proportional to exponential of EI divided by temperature. So we have temperature, this is the real thermal temperature. Tg is not a temperature in the sense that it, it's not a thermal temperature. It's nothing to do with, directly with Boltzmann statistics. It's simply a measure of how strong is the disorder. So this temperature is, of course, different than this Tg. And then we said, OK, the deeper you are, so EI is a random variable. If you are very deep, it will take you a very long time to escape. And this is the Boltzmann factor. There is some pre-factor here which we don't care about, which is usually very, the, the, the important part about this pre-factor is that it does not depend exponentially. So exponential dependence is very crucial here because a, a small change in EI will make a tremendous change in this tau i, while a prefactor here does not significantly change. So th this is an exper a, a 
This is an exponential sensitivity, which is the basics of ordinary statistical physics. There's nothing special about this. This is just the Boltzmann factor. So what you see here, that here I have an exponential, and here I have an exponential. So both these distributions, uh, th this is a distribution and this law, they have two exponentials, and sometimes people call this an exponential conspiration. Because by assuming something very, you know, not very wide, it's not that these energies, what, what would happen if these energies were power laws, for example, power law distributed, then you would be totally stuck, and this alpha would be zero. Because you will have one guy that is so deep, you will go down there and you will not move at all. So this distribution is not wide. All the moments are finite, nothing special about it so much. But still, because of this exponential, it's enough to have a very moderate, so to say, disorder in order to introduce something very dramatic in the behavior of the packet spreading on this guy. Just to remind you that the, the rules were then the following. I stay here, I, I stay in this site. Tau i from this specific energy, I wait. Yeah. So here I wait a lot, here I wait not so much, etc., etc. And then I jumped with probability half to nearest neighbors. If I have a bias, this external force, then I'll, I'll hop more to this direction than to that direction with a bias, which I can model with a random walk with some probability of jumping right, p, p bigger than half, and q jumping left, and p plus q is equal to 1, of course. So that will be a biased random walk. And what we showed in previous class is that if I average this, that what we get is a waiting time PDF that for large times decays like this power law. So he, here, this was done simply by change of variables. You, to, you, 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 you assume these guys are exponential. If these guys are exponential, with the Jacobian, I can find the distribution of tau r, and they were given by this law. And alpha, again, is t over tg. Sometimes alpha is less than 1, and then you get anomalous diffusion. Sometimes alpha is bigger than 1, then you get here normal diffusion. But this was the crucial part of all the analysis. What are we doing here, actually? We are replacing the disordered system with, a, with a, what we call a nailed model, or with CTRW. So what we do here is, we say, OK, let's, we have a lattice now. This is space, x. And the lattice, of course, corresponds to this. This is the lattice distance. And then we say, OK, we don't have any random energy anymore. Forget about it. But we have a waiting time PDF that goes like tau 1 plus alpha. So this is the CTRW. And that means the following. I look at this like this. Let's say I don't have a bias. There's no force. I start here, for example. Then I wait here. Then I jump here. Then I wait here. Then I jump here. Then I wait here. Then I jump here. But statistically, this point and this point, they are totally the same, right? Each time you arrive at this point, you, you, you take from this distribution, this PDF, you take this waiting time. So this, this is what uh, uh, this is called the mean field approximation. In the following sense, if, if your system is really like this, quenched, what you're doing here, you are replacing the really disordered system with a, an average thing which has no structure in it, right? That, in that sense, it's mean field. Mean field means an average process. The average process was to take this. Now, this average doesn't mean that this doesn't exist really in nature. What does it mean? It means that 
let's say you have this trap, but after you jump, you kill this trap and you create a new one. So that would be annealed. What does it mean annealed disorder? It means that the disorder itself is changing in time during your measurement. So you can have this situation in real life, but uh, what I wanted to say simply is quenched is not the same as annealed, that these two thing, th this thing is an approximation, let's say, for this thing. So let us believe that the quench disorder is the real thing. You have an experiment and the disorder itself is not changing in time. So then the question is, is this and this this mean field approximation, is it a good approximation? The answer turns out to be it is a, a very good approximation, but not in dimension one. Dimension one is different than higher dimension. And this is something very nice. So, you have questions on the difference between the models? You understand the difference? It's clear more or less? Is that a, what is not, uh, is it clear or not? You laughed more than others, so <laughs> I'm asking you. Right. Well, but they're not specific for a point. So this guy has random waiting times as well. But they are specific to this point and that point. So if, what is the big difference? Let's look at this trajectory. I, I am here. I, I draw this waiting time. It jumps here. Tuck, 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 tuck here, right? Now let us do the same on this energy landscape. So if I start, let's say I start here, right? I started this one. This is a short time. Then the, I, I wait a very short time because I'm on this one. Then let's say I jumped here. I wait a long time because now I'm in a deep, 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 deep trap. Then I go back, let's say, and then it, it will be again a, a short one. Then I go back here. It's again a long, long one. So there is a correlation between this time and this time because if you are here, you wait long. So while here, there's no correlation. Why there's no correlation? Each time I, I go to this point, I, I draw from this random variable, and it's renewed. So this is the, this renewal property. For example, if you put it in equilibrium, let's say you take a particle, you, you have a re reflecting box, and you start many particles, inside this box. So this means that if I reach here, then they will simply go back. They can only jump to here. You, s you put here uh, on your simulation, you have 10 to the 10 particles, in, and let's say the lattice is 20, for example. You simulate. You start all of them here, and you simulate for a long time. What will be the density after a long time? It will be totally uniform. Where are the particles? Once you'll find the, at time t, you know, one of them will be here in the long time limit. It will be totally uniform distribution. On the other hand, if I, I block this and put it in uh, with reflecting boundary conditions and I go to low temperatures, where is my density going to be? It's going to be on one more, at, at zero temperature, it will be a delta function here. So in the CTRW, the equilibrium in a box is flat. In the quench model, depending on the disorder, I'll have some, any, some, this is my density. And what is this peak? And this peak, here it happened that the biggest trap was here. And here it happened that the, biggest the second biggest trap was here. This is the equilibrium, the thermal equilibrium of this system. Now, what happens is that this is specific for one disorder. I generate on my computer one disorder, I get one, one type of energy landscape and then one equilibrium. So this is the equilibrium, P equilibrium of X. This is the P equilibrium 
of x. Again, many particles, you draw histograms, all sites are, this is the, the CTRW, all sites are the same. There's no difference if there's no field. There's no, there's no external field, there's no bias, probability of jumping left right here is, is half. And then uh, all of them are the same, they're just from symmetry they are uniform. But here you, it's obvious that they will accumulate somewhere. Now, so the quench model is very difficult model. It's not an exactly solvable model. People until today don't know how to solve it exactly. They know a lot about it, but it's not something that you can solve. Why? What is it all the questions with, 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 uh, with quench models? So, in quench, here, both models, we want to know what is P, X, and T. What is the probability of finding the particle at position X at time T? That's the usual question, right? And you can formulate these questions by formulating the models, both for the quench model and for the anneal model. And here I gave something intuitive uh, picture in equilibrium how these guys will look like. But in the quench model, what people are actually looking at many times is not P, X, and T for one given realization of the random potential field. What we care about is the average Px of mt. And this is an average of a what? This is average over this order. What it means is the following, that when I have the quench disorder, I have actually two types of averages. One. This is my quench model. This is, the, this is the energy traps. One is a thermal average, or average over trajectories of the particle. So I have a trajectory, then the particle is here, it waits long here, it goes back. And I can generate many trajectories like this and ask what is the probability? This probability is specific for one realization of this order. So the probability density function itself is a random variable. P, X, and T is random because you have a random energy landscape. So what I can do is I can generate trajectories for one realization. This is for one realization. One realization of what? Not of the path of the disorder, and then I can generate another, another trajectory, and the other trajectory might go somewhere like that. And then for one realization of disorder, I can find this Px of, in, of t. It will be a super complicated function because it will depend on the traps. Where are they in space? It will look something horrible like this. Now what I do is I say, I don't take one re realization of disorder, I take one of them and then I take a second, of the, second realization and then do many trajectories over many different realizations of this order. And then I average the densities. So for example, in equilibrium, I have system one, I have a system, and this is the energy landscape, something like that. This is only in equilibrium, not, no time yet. And okay, what will be the density in equilibrium? It's going to be a Boltzmann density, so here I'm going to have a peak, here I'm going to have a peak, and here a smaller peak, something like that. Then I take another realization of disorder. So I generate these traps, one after the other. And this time, let's say here I had a bigger trap. These are the traps. And now the density will have a peak here, maybe here or something bigger, in equilibrium. Now what I do is I take this, this density, of, so this is, this, this is the density, the probability density of trajectories in the long time limit when they reached equilibrium, they interacted many times with the wall, 
for uh, this other one. And then you have the density for this order two. And because the particle experiences different potential fields, and that means different traps, and that means di different forces, these two densities are not the same. I can do with this many things. I can take, for example, what is the distribution of the densities if I wanted to? That would be a little bit difficult. But what people are usually doing is saying, OK, I have P, X, and T average of a disorder. So that would mean you, you simulate, for example, you simulate with one realization of disorder, you get one density. For that, you need many trajectories in this disorder or energy landscape. Then you, 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 you generate another disorder. You generate it again. And then you average all the results over both particles. That means do, both thermal paths and disorder. This is the second average here. The same holds, for example, for MSD. What is MSD at all? MSD, I can write for one realization of disorder. What is the MSD? Here the MSD may be, in, the, in this, if I measure it from zero, here I measure it from zero. So here the MSD is bigger because the, the trap happened to be far away. So this could be, this average here is only thermal average. Thermal or particle averages. X squared thermal. Then you add another average of a disorder. And then you get an MSD. So my bottom line is simple. There are two averages in when you have a quench disorder. It's way more complicated than just the CTRW that has only one type of average, average over trajectories. So now, is this clear? The difference between quench and anneal is clear. It's fundamental. It's fundamental everywhere in condensed matter. It's not the same thing, simply. Uh, you, 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 you need to appreciate the, the difficulty. Uh, so so you, you can ask, wait, if I have, let's say I'm go, I, I, in the laboratory, what do I actually have? Do I have, I have one system only, right? And it's random. So maybe the results are specific to what I have in the lab laboratory. And what is the meaning of this average? Because in the average, I don't average over disordered systems. That is a slightly sl subtle uh, question. What exactly is done in experiments in disordered materials when, with this quench disorder? So for example, why is this averaging over systems? Why does it make sense, uh, even if in the laboratory you have only one system? Sometimes, by the way, it doesn't make sense at all. You need to think. So, but imagine the situation where you have This is your energy landscape, something crazy like this. You can have many situations. Let's say you have a bias here, force like this. And then maybe you have, and, and you make the experiment for some finite time t. And then you have one particle started here, but then another particle started here. And then another particle started here, and they're all biased in that way because of the external global field. So, and then you measure it. And in the experiment, let's say the, the, the particle can, can go some distance. What is the distance? It will be random, of course, because depending on the different energy landscape that each one of these particles experiences. So here there's, again, another random energy landscape. But my, my point is the following. In this experiment, this particle sees this is a particle starting somewhere with a given measurement time. So this particle sees this random energy landscape. This particle sees this guy. This particle sees that guy. So each particle sees a different energy landscape, which is random. Okay? So 
when I average over this order, it makes sense because I have the density of this particle, one disorder, another disorder, another disorder, etc., etc., etc. So sometimes the average over disorder makes sense. But if, for example, I take all my particles and all of them start here, and you measure until time t, then maybe this specific realization of disorder is important for that experiment because all the particles see exactly the same thing within the experiments. So this is kind of obvious. You have hikers in the world. If all the hikers start, let's say, on the, the Himalaya range, they see the run, 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 landscape of the Himalaya. But if you start different places, some of them are in the Alps, some of them in the Himalaya, some of them are whatever you want, then you can average over the landscape also. But it just means that you need to think before you average, because the averaging, even the averaging is not trivial. But, but now we are going to say, OK, I mentioned briefly before, there is a fundamental difference between the models which depends on dimensions. And this is the main point now, is that dimensionality is crucial. And especially now I want to talk through the case there's no bias. Actually, with bias, the dimensionality stops to be important. And we will soon understand why. So what I said already was that when you have this quench disorder, the particle can come back to the same trap he visited in the past. For example, this class is your trap. You come back every week, and you are trapped there for three hours, right? So the fact that you come back to specifically this location means there is a correlation between your trapping time today and the trapping time one week ago. It's the same trapping time, more or less, three hours. While if you go some other places, there's no correlation. So in quench disorder, as I said already, there is a correlation. We have a correlation between what? The correlation between Trapping times. That means there is no renewal. This then is doubtful. When are these correlations very important? The answer is in one dimension. Why? It's kind of clear, but not obvious. So here I have my random energy landscape, something like this. These are the potentials. So in one dimension, I start, let's say, here, as I mentioned before, you come back and you visit. So you revisit sites many times. This is something that you learned already when you did the usual random walk. In the usual random walk, you know that if a, you start somewhere on a line, doing a usual random walker, you start here, it will reach this point with probability one. That is called the recurrence property. You always come back. When do you not come back? For example, if you walk in three dimensions. In three dimensions, let's say, so let's put it, I, I cannot do it in three dimensions. If you have both a usual walk so you have a lattice. I'm just plotting one part of it. What is happening? I'm not plot plotting inside the, the board, but what is happening is you go like that between lattice points. And then the probability to return is less than unity. What it means, to return means, uh, what is the probability that one day I'll come back? What, what does it really mean? And this is the important point. Here I sample new, that's the most important word, new sites 
frequently. So I'm doing a random walk in dimension 3 or dimension 4 or 24. And when I'm walking, I have these traps. These are local. And then when I walk, I, I jump to some new place. Then I ask myself, is this place that I visit now, is it new or did I visit it in the past? The answer is that in high dimensions, because I have many options of jumping, so if I have here a lattice point, and then my, in, in, in three dimensions I have six nearest neighbors, then I jump, and then usually I go and find a site that I didn't visit before, something new. This site has some energy depth, a trap, but the point is it's new. It, while if you go in one dimension, then many times you come back and you visit the same point. So when you walk in one dimension, you have a very strong correlation. When you walk in dimension three and four and five and six, and of course in dimension infinity, the correlation is not there. And what does it mean? It means that when you do this uh, comparison between the quench trap model and the mean field approximation in dimension three, and four, etc. The predictions of the quenched model and the and the CTRW, the mean field, are exactly the same in the following sense. So, okay. So in 3D, relations are not important. In some sense, the theta w is equal to the quench trap model. In the following sense, for the theta w, this goes like t to the alpha, like before. Alpha is, let's say, less than 1. This is t over tg. And similarly, here we have two averages, one over the disorder and one over the pass. So this is CTRW. This is quenched. The same alpha. The prefactors here, here and here, can be slightly different, but the main the main issue is that the correlations do not affect this alpha. They can affect the prefactors here, but that's a number. That's a not, we don't call this significant. I mean, because if you have in one model alpha and another model something else, then of course the predictions are very, very different. So I'm not saying that the correlations are totally not important. They are important because also in three dimensions, when are they exactly the same? Also these prefactors. Can anyone guess? In what dimension they are exactly the same? Dimension infinity. If you have a lattice with infinite dimensions, then they'll be totally the same. Because if you have an infinite number of nearest neighbors, when you jump somewhere, you are not, you are going to go to some new site that you never visited, so there's no correlations. So these prefactors become identical when the dimension is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But more importantly is the phase transition that when you are in three dimensions, they are the same. But what happens in one dimension? What happens in one dimension is that they are not the same. So in one dimensions, um, first I'll give you the result. This is for the trap model. This goes like t2 alpha, 1 plus alpha, while here this goes for the CTRW, for the mean field, it goes like t to the alpha. The new thing here is this exponent, 2 alpha, 1 plus alpha. So this is dimension 1. If I plot these exponents versus alpha, alpha again is t over tg, and I stop the plot at 1, 
So one of them is a straight line. This is the CTRW line. This one, you see, when alpha is 0, it's 0. When alpha is 1, it's 1. It goes something like that. This is 2 alpha, 1 plus alpha. It's, there is a deviation. And this, this is because of the correlations of the random walk. And then things are complicated, even not proven rigorously. People believe this is the case, but uh, there's no mathematical proof. Even mathematicians cannot prove this. So dimension one, correlation is important. Now, without, if you just believe me for a second, soon we'll try and hand wave and explain why you get a different exponent here. Now, we, if you understand what I was saying, you can easily answer the following question. All this is valid when there is no bias. When my jump, I can wait. I can wait depending on the energy of the trap, or I can wait in the CTRW. But my probability of jumping left and right was half. That's no bias. So, no bias. Now, what will happen if you have bias? So, bias again, you have a probability which is higher to jump, let's say, to the right than to the left. What will happen there even in one dimensions? So what happens when you have bias? You jump more to this side than to that side. It's true that sometimes you come back, but after some time, you don't revisit. So when you have the bias, the correlations are not important. There's a fundamental difference between biased random walks and non-biased random walks. So when you have a bias, even in one dimension, the two predictions are the same. OK, even for small biases, you are starting to be also a practical question. So for small bias and small bias, but for long times, they are the same. But for small bias, the meaning of long times can depend on how strong your bias is. So what I'm trying to say here is that for any epsilon bias, wait long enough. But in laboratory, it's possible that you are right if the bias is so small that it, it will take it a long time until it will notice at all that it has a bias. And then for some short times, you are, you are, a, you are experiencing a big difference between the two models. In other words, when I write these equations, they always mean this is the sin in the limit of very long times. So. Convergence problems, that's an interesting thing. Because you see there is a phase transition here when alpha is less than 1 and alpha bigger than 1. So if you know that when you have a phase transition and you are close to some critical point, maybe someone told you in some other course, you have a problem of convergence time. The, 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 the critical phenomena you need to measure, for example, when you know, I, I know this because I come from Tel Aviv University, and then there was this guy, Voronel, that very long time ago, he measured the critical exponents of the phase transition. And he did it in, I don't know, 1960s or 70s in the in USSR. That means that Russia today. <laughs> the point is that to measure this, when you are close to these uh, critical points in phase transitions, he, his all capability was that he could measure the system for maybe 48 hours maintain a constant temperature coming very close to the phase transition and measuring for very long times because the convergence always is very slow when you are, because it's kind of intuitive uh, when you have a phase transition, uh, you know, the system doesn't know should it behave this like or that like, the, the, the system is confused in some vague sense. Here we, we also have a, a very similar behavior that when alpha goes from slightly less than one to to one, when you go from anomalous to normal, the convergence can be very, very bad. It will take it a long time. And you can ask what happens when alpha is exactly one in the power. Then you have some logarithmic corrections. It's a zoo. So I'm not talking about this issue at all. I'm talking in principle when you reach already a very long time limit. But all these issues are uh, another story, not, not, not for now. So 
we see there is a difference, and now I want to very, um, I would say, hand wavingly uh, prove that this is the case. When I say prove, is that this is a physicist proof, which means it's not a proof at all, but it's still much better than the mathematicians can do because they can't do anything. So now we need to think uh, how to analyze this quench model. So I'm not now analyzing, no, the, again, no bias. 1D and then the quenched model. And I'm interested in the MSD. And when I say the MSD, I mean an average over disorder and thermal. And I'm not even interested in the MSD. I'm only interested in the, the time dependence of the MSD and the limit of long times. So the general uh, argument is like this. Um, X squared, which is the position of the particle, we're, we are doing here random walks. The fact that we wait, OK, who cares? Let's say you have a disorder. Uh, and someone tells you, this guy walked 1,000 steps, or this guy uh, in, in an ensemble of systems, all, all, all these guys walked 1,000 steps, all these guys walked 1 million steps. What is their MSD? B because, because the probability of jumping left or right was just half. Their MSD goes like N. What is N? This is normal diffusion. N is the number of steps. N itself is random, but in some hand-waving argument, if you walk, the bigger is N, the bigger is the MSD. On average, X average should be zero because the average is zero because of symmetry of the disorder. This, on average, the disorder is symmetric. So I say X squared is scaling with N, but the big issue is, of course, what is this n? How is this n related to time? So here I just reformulate the problem. I don't know what is n. How does n this really scale with time? And this means scaling like n. Is this clear? This x squared goes like n, what it means? Very simple random walk, actually. So, so now we want to think uh, 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 and we want to say, OK, we have n. But what, what we want to say is, what is actually t? T is the measurement time. T is what I know. The, the guy who measures the, uh, these particles, he stops after one minute or two minutes or one hour or one day, whatever. This is the measurement time. But how is this related to N? So I, I'm going to write down the equation. I'm going to say this is going to be Ni tam, tai, tau i. And what is Ni? And what is tau i? So I have uh, this random energy landscape. And then I have a trajectory. And then th 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 this, let's say, this we call side 0, minus 1, plus 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Then here I have n0, here I have n4. n0 is the number of times the particle visited site zero. So in this, so here I, I visited site zero, one, two, three, this is three. What is N4? This is this site. N4 I visited zero sites. So Ni is the number of, is the number of visits to location I. Lo location I, I is the position because the lattice spacing here is one, let's say, OK? So this guy I visit three times. This guy here, this guy I visit, this is n minus this one. n minus one is one. I visited it one time. Here I visited it two times. And here I visited zero. In this very short trajectory, of course, we do it for much longer trajectories. And then what I say is tau, let's say I visited it one site 
20 times. And this specific site, let's say site 0, you have a waiting time specific to that site. So here I have tau 0, tau 1, tau minus 1. These are given by the distribution, which is a power law. So I visited one site five times, and this specific site had 20 at the time to stay 20. So this is, you know, 5 times 20, this will be 100. And while a site, maybe it can be very deep, but I never visited it, it will not co contribute anything because this ni will be 0. Now, what is this n? This n is the sum of all the ni's. In principle, the sum goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. I sum over all the i's, but many of these ni's, because I measure for some time t, many most lightest points, of course, I didn't visit at all. They are far away. So many of these ni's are 0. Most of the ni's that are not 0 are close to the origin and in its surrounding somehow. OK, what I want to do now is I want to find the connection between n and t. If I have a connection between n and t, then I can find x squared. That's our goal. OK? So how do we, we know the statistics of this guy. These are given by these power laws. We don't know so much about these ni's. The point about these ni's is essentially by doing this trick, we, we are actually getting rid of these um, times tau r. Because now I have an ordinary random walk jumping half left and right. So let us look, or let us argue if you want, as a physicist would argue, what is this ni's? So let's draw some picture and roughly estimate how, how does this work. So the idea is the following. In an, I take a, th this is space. Here I did not visit. This is, you know, like these maps that people used to plot. There are some places where no one visited, where you, they put the monsters here and here. The particle didn't visit. So here I did not visit. I started here. And here also, did not visit. This means the, these ni is here, here, ni is 0. Now I have n steps. So how, where roughly do I visit? How big is this regime? This is space x. So how big is this? How does this scale with n? This should scale with n like square root of n, like an ordinary random walk. So, so you can think about there is some kind of more or less Gaussian distribution or something, but its width, this is position, scales with, it's the same as this scaling law. The width is scaling like square root of n. So roughly, what is ni? Yeah, but this is in n, not in time. So the point is, consider this random walk on this. That's the whole point. Consider this random walk, and you have these waiting times. I'm not saying n is proportional to time. But I'm saying, given that you have n, you don't care about the waiting time now anymore. That's the whole trick. Because you jump left and right with probability half. OK, so the whole trick is, this is not time. This is time. So I'm saying you sample now on a range which is square root of n, but I'm not saying how this n is related to time t. OK, it's more or less clear. And again, I agree, it's, uh, it's something really, in my opinion, a little, little dip, deep. But now I'm going to say, OK, roughly, what is ni? Um, so, so, OK, let us write this. Ni's, I don't need to sum the Ni, this is N. But now what do I say? So I, we're going to do the following. Ni is equal to 0 um, for I 
le, uh, bigger than square root of n or i less than minus square root of n. In principle, there are numbers here. I don't care about these numbers because this is just a scaling theory. So what does this mean? It means that I don't need to sum here from minus infinity to infinity because that is stupid because most of these n i's are zero. You don't visit here. I'm going to sum here um, over the i's from 0 to square root of n. And this means that, I, and, and now I'm going to do another approximation, which I even don't know how to write this equality. It's roughly equality. Yeah, yeah but who cares? I don't care because, you see, I'm not looking at the coefficient of t to the alpha. There's tools, there are many things. This is not, a, a, not an exact theory at all. From here, from this guy, you, you, you easily see the following, that this ni is equal to um, square root of n. If each one of them is, is square root of n, I have square root of n, then if I multiply, I get n. If you can do better than this, then please do. Because no one can, I mean. I say within the zone, within this zone, if each one of them is square root of n. Yeah, it's Gaussian, but we don't care even about that. Because we cut it, we cut it off here. It's true that in the middle there is a bit more than here. You are absolutely right. But we approximate this by that. Because in scaling, it will not uh, matter. It's true that there is more weight at the uh, uh, center and less, but here it will not affect. But you're absolutely correct. So this is the square root of n. Now, now comes the following. Um, OK, so now I need to go back to the time. So now I say, OK, this time t, this is this equation, is sum over n i tau i. And then what I say is I'm going to sum only up to square root of n. Because again, the n i's for bigger i are simply 0. And again, there is a number here. And I neglected the weight. I'm just using the scaling with time, that's all. And then uh, here I have square root of n. That is because each one of these ni's is, I take as identical. And then here I have sum over tau i. Now, here comes this. Now we're going to look at this part, this part. This part is a sum of tau i. Now, again, recall what are these tau i's. These are, there is this disorder. These tau i's are not like the CTRW. This is t0, t1, t2, t minus 1. They are specific to the traps that you realize within this radius of square root of n. These tau i are, however, this is the assumption, tau i are iid random variables, specific to locations. So you see here, I, I got rid of the correlations because I'm just looking at specific locations in space. Tau 0 plus tau 1. So what do we have here? This is a famous problem that you know already. This is a sum of IID random variables. With a strange, it's not up to n, it's up to square root of n. And you could, of course, ask, but the square root of n is not a number. OK, take the nearest number, whatever. So we have here sum of IID random variables. This sounds like center limit theorem. And if you thought about this, then you were right. But it's not as a usual central limit theorem. This is a Levy central limit theorem. Levy always enters at the end. 
Why is it a Levy Central Limit Strength? Because the PDFs of these guys are what we said, the PDF of tau i, these are these power laws. With what? With alpha equal t over tg, as we said before. Again, this is the quench. There is no uh, annealed. So th this is a PDF of the waiting time specific to the site i. It's independent of the index i because they are all iid. But this is this guy. So now we know how this total time, how does it scale? So we just take the scaling form. This is square root of n. And then this guy um, goes like square root of n, 1 over alpha. This is the Levy scaling. This is the Levy scaling. Which says that if I take the sum of these guys, I need to rescale it by square root of n. 1 over alpha to get a limit distribution according to Levy. This was in the class a few weeks ago. So this is the, 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 the where uh, Levy enters and central limit theorem uh, arguments enter. And then we get the following. We get t is equal to n to the half n 1 over 2 alpha. which is equal to n to alpha. And here I have um, alpha plus 1. So from here I get a t to alpha 1 plus alpha is going like n. And that's, that's it, because then x squared goes like 2 alpha 1 plus alpha. Now, as I already mentioned, this is, of course, a hand-waving argument. What do people actually do? Um, they do simulations. They pr perform this simulation. They average. They, they take many realizations of this order. And then they average. And then they, they can check this way, this result. In experiment, it's kind of difficult, actually, to measure this. Because the difference between this exponent and alpha is not so big. This difference, there is a small difference, but you need to be very capable experimentalist to see this difference. And because you never know exactly what is TG and all kinds of things like that, I don't think this was even measured in an experiment, not verified in an experiment. So all what I said here is a theoretical prediction not by the mathematicians, but by the physicists, backed up by simulation. What did mathematicians prove? They have very nice proofs, but they can prove things, for example, in three dimensions. What I said before, that in three dimensions, the city so in three dimensions, this will go like alpha here. This was proven rigorously by mathematicians, but this is a scaling argument that people believe in, but it's not rigorously proven. For me, it's more important that I try to convey the difficulty of this problem. Why is it difficult? Not this specific result is not so important. I, just to, I wanted you to start thinking on the differences between quench disorder and anneal disorder. Uh, this is a vast uh, area, and this is only one example where you see these differences. Um, we will, uh, I, uh, okay, we'll go now for a short break, and then I, after the break, we will go back to the continuous time random walk, and we will just ask what is the, what is Px and T in the limit of long time? So, if you did not hand in, so please do that. OK, 
Okay, so um, So we want to analyze the spreading of packet of particles within this uh, continuous time random walk model, assuming that the waiting time distribution is very broad. It's a fat tail with the mean is diverging. And because the mean is diverging, we of course expect deviations from Gaussian central limit theorem. But the question is, can we quantify this? So we consider the CTRW. We do it in dimension one, because many of the results I'm going to show you now, you can easily general, generalize. And we're going to do it for the simplest case when you have unbiased random walk. So remember that we have here in this game, we have psi of tau, for very large tau, it decays like t to the minus one plus alpha. And we are going to consider the case when alpha is between 0 and 1. The, the, ba the ba basic message is that if alpha here is bigger than 1, let's say 2 or 23 or whatever, the mean exists. And if the mean exists, eventually the packet is spreading like a Gaussian. So uh, if uh, alpha bigger than 1, p, x, and t, this is a Gaussian. In some sense, it's very similar to, what do you mean it's a Gaussian? I mean, it's a Gaussian in the limit of long measurement times. How fast you converge to Gaussian, that depends on the details. What is the psi of t? What is the jump length distribution? All kinds of things. This is Gaussian when the PDF of jump lengths So these are the jump lengths. Um, we assume, uh, for example, that this is equal to the PDF of minus delta x. So it's symmetric. There is no, uh, prob the probability to jump from here to there and from here to there is the same. There is no bias. This is what it means. But we also assume that the moments of uh, this function, which I'm going to call simply f of delta x, are finite. It doesn't matter what exactly is this distribution, but we assume that sigma squared, and that is the variance of the size of the jump, is finite. So roughly speaking, if the average time between jumps is finite, and if the variance of the size of the jumps is also finite, then you get Gaussian spreading. And it's exactly like Brownian motion, like usual random walks. The number of jumps for the normal case what is the number of jumps in the long time limit? It will go like the measurement time divided by the average time between jumps. And then you essentially do a usual random walk where n is the number of steps. And you simply replace n with how, how many steps you made in average. And you know that when you sum IID random variables, because the jumps here are independent of each other, then um, you get a Gaussian, and all you need to do now is think how you replace n by the measurement time. And when this, this is finite, you do it like that, and then you get a Gaussian. So in this case, this is a tau finite. And then everything is similar to a ordinary Brownian, ordinary uh, random walks. Ordinary random walks, I mean, where the number of steps is fixed, while here the number of steps is fluctuating, also known as Brownian motion. 
Okay, so just to repeat, we said it several times, though, you start, this is x, you start on the origin, you have two functions, f delta x, let's say f delta x, maybe it's something like a Gaussian, or maybe it's uniform, but its mean is zero, or it could be two delta functions, that would be a random walk on the lattice, or it can be three delta functions, you can also stay in place, whatever you want. You generate, uh, and you have this waiting time. It doesn't matter what is exactly the shape of this waiting time PDF for short times. This is we don't care about because we are interested, interested in, in this time limit of long time. So only what we care about is this tail. And then you have uh, uh, you have some waiting, and then you. So this is tau 1, then you have delta x1, then you have tau 2, then you have delta x, etc., delta x2, and then you have some time t, and your particle is somewhere in space, and then you want to know what is the density of the particles all starting on one origin, which we can call x equals 0. And again, we'd want to do that in the limit of long times. In the limit of short times, we have a formal solution that was given in the previous class. And that is given by this montreal weiss equation. <coughs> so the montreal weiss equation it says the following. We have the Fourier transform of this jump length distribution, and we have the Laplace transform of the waiting time PDF. So K is for Fourier, S is for um, Laplace, S goes with time, and space X goes with K. And these hats and tildes means Fourier transform of the original function, the hat means the Laplace transform of the original function. And you all know what's a Laplace and Fourier transform, I hope. Then we can calculate, instead of P, uh, X and T, we can calculate exactly, and this is very general, we can calculate P, K, and S. And it's given by this equation. I'll, we had it on the blackboard already, on the whiteboard. But I'll explain it again. So this is a formal solution. In principle, this contains also, for example, if you have a bias, any type of waiting time PDF in any dimensions, you just need, just quote unquote, to take the inverse Laplace transform and inverse Fourier transform, which generally is, of course, very difficult. And we don't know how to do it in general. We can do it sometimes on a, on a computer. But in general, we don't know how to do this. So um, there is another solution, another way to present the solution, but it's again, it's a formal solution. And that is just coming from the model itself. And this other method of solution is the following. We write it as an infinite sum. n equals 0 to infinity. p n t. p, uh, how do I want to write it? Yeah, OK. I think it's not confusing, but maybe I'm wrong. Px given n. I use only the word letter p. But what is this pn? This is the probability to make n jumps. So the random variable here, this is a probability. The sum of a pn's is equal to 1. Of course, when we increase the measurement time, there's more likely to have more jumps. 
So the jumps is a renewal process because these uh, waiting times are IID. So we have, this is the time axis now. This is the measurement time T and then we have an N. So this is tau one, this is tau two, blah, blah, blah. This is so-called the backward recurrence time. This is the time between the the last event and the measurement time. And these tau i's, they are drawn from psi of tau. So psi of tau alone defines the time axis and these events. On these events, we have jumps given by the other function, f of delta x, that you draw each time. And this n is random because the waiting time is uh, uh, a random and then the number of jumps between 0 and t is random and then we have this probability of making n jumps and this probability of making n jumps is of course related to psi and in Laplace space there is a very simple equ equation that we showed already pn s is equal to 1 minus psi s s psi s to power n So we know the beauty of this thing is that this guy, the time depends only, is entering only here. This guy on the other hand is the probability density. This is already a probability density, at least if, if f of x is continuous. So this is the probability density, this is the PDF of finding the particle on x given that uh, we made n jumps. Now, this guy we solved separately. This is the usual random walk where we fix n. n can be 0, 1, 2, 3. So we know exactly this expression in Fourier space. In Fourier space, this is just the Fourier transform f of k to the power n, this is the usual solution of the ordinary random walk. So if we know this in Fourier space and we know this in Laplace space, we can actually perform the sum and you see a p, p k in Fourier space given n is simply f of k to the power n and then we have psi of psi s to the power n f the power n and you have this geometric series, you, you sum this geometric series in Fourier Laplace space, you get this expression. All this was given in the previous class. So now uh, we want to know what is this but only in the long time limit. So essentially hand wavingly what we can say is the following. I want to know what this does in the long time limit. And now I'm going to assume, let's assume that psi of s is 1 minus s to the power alpha. In general, there can be here some constant a. I'm taking this constant to be 1 just to simplify the notation. This is, this is the smallest behavior. This is the same as what I said before, that the waiting time PDF is a power law, such that the mean tau is now infinite because alpha is less than 1. For example, if I take the derivative here with respect to s, so I get here s alpha minus 1, I take 0, I get infinity. This is the non-analytical behavior at small s of this waiting time PDF. Okay, I assume this uh, all along and then of course there are corrections which we don't care about actually. And then we want to treat uh, this one. So, what, we, uh, what turns out to be the truth, and it makes a lot of sense, as we, we think about this, we want to look at lo long time t. At long time t, what is important? Large n. The fact that the average time between jumps is infinity, we don't care about it. The number of jumps here, when I increase, will be tremendous. Actually, we know that the average n the average number of jumps scales like t to the alpha. 
So if I make t bigger and bigger and bigger, alpha is less than one, so it's, it's not increasing linearly, but it's increasing. We don't care that it doesn't increase linearly. This average n is becoming very, very big. And similarly, we expect that Pn of t, the main contributions for large t will be for n here, is going to be big. Then, if that is true, then you have px given n. What is px given n when n is big? That will be a Gaussian because this is simply the usual random walk where you have n fixed. So if n is large, then this is a Gaussian. So what we do is we do the following. I mean, this is uh, the result. We say, OK. I have p, x, and t goes like, now t is going to infinity, sum n equals 0 to infinity, p, n of t, p, x given n. And then I say, what is this guy? R for some function. It was immediately defined. So th these functional derivatives are not something new in in, uh, at least in mass. In mass, they are very old. They are as old as ordinary derivatives. But in physics, they are not used, so you don't know about them. But it's a very old field and in mass that in physics gained some interest because of this illusion. Uh, that was a wave in the end of the 90s. There was a lot of activity on that. But I'm not going to go in that direction, just that you should know. So now, um, in this short time remaining, um, let me just say, OK, so we wrote down what is the propagator and the long time limit. But we wrote it as an integral. Now let's actually solve it. What is p, x, and t in the limit of long time? Um, and this I'm going to do without solving the integral directly. I'm going to do this absolute value of x already tells you that there's something slightly interesting going on x equals 0 in the sense that this PDF is going to be non-analytical on average x. If I add it to the power 2, then of course, it would be a Gaussian, but it's not. So, so now, OK, th this, is, uh, this is this P x s. And now I need to rub my head and ask, how do I invert it from s to x, s to time t? So we added similar things already. What, what is going on here? You see, here I have s to the alpha. This gives you to the s to the alpha over 2 because of the square root. This gives you, if I didn't have this, what is this? This is the Levy distribution, right? Because again, the Levy distribution, now with some scale, a 1s, in Laplace space, this is something like a s to the alpha. So actually, maybe it's better to write it alpha over 2. So see, this is the levy. But what is this thing? That's the derivative. It's the same trick like before. So if I take the derivative with respect to s, I'll get outside here s alpha over 2 minus 1. Again, taking the derivative with respect to s is like multiplying the function with time t. So what do I see for all this? Because of this s alpha over 2, alpha over 2 came from this pole. I get the Levy function, but with index alpha over 2. Multiplied by t, multiplied by all this. I'm not going to um, write it. So using uh, d over ds t, I'm not going to write down all this, but taking the derivative. Uh, eventually, you get the following p, x, and t. Here is, 
equal to um, t that comes from the derivative with respect to s. Uh, there is an alpha. Actually, there's an alpha over 2, but it cancels. Square root of 2 times sigma 2 over alpha x 1, 1 plus alpha the Levy function of 1, 1. 1, 1 means that I can take this a as 1. This 1 means that this is the one-sided Levy functions. So these, these functions, the Levy functions look like power laws in real space. No, yeah, but I'm going to re change the scale here. So you can do it in two ways. I can put here the scale inside, or I can rescale everything. This is exactly what I'm done here. So I hope you understand that. You see, when you take the inverse for, uh, uh, Laplace transform, here I have a. I can put a here and change the definition of time when I go from s to t. And this is what I, the, the reason is that. It's better to define this function with 1, 1. This is the, how people usually do it. Because this, this function is tabulated. So uh, this is times t uh, sigma to the power 2 of alpha square root of 2, absolute value of x, 2 over alpha. Now, this of course by itself is not so instructive, but let's look what we have here inside here. Here I have a scaling of this function, the Levy function, of the type tx to the power 2 alpha. I hope all of you understand that this is the same as scaling of x divided by t uh, to the power alpha over 2. Yeah, because if I take one over this and then I square it as with t to the alpha, then I'll have this 2 over alpha. This will be this t and this. So the bottom line is that this is a function, maybe this Levy function, with a scaling of t of alpha over 2, 1 over t alpha over 2. Alpha would be 1 for normal diffusion. The scaling function is given explicitly by this expression. And this scaling, for example, means that x squared goes like t to the alpha, as we know. But here we are saying something much stronger. The whole PDF scales like this. We also know what is special, what is the simplest thing alpha to check is, of course, alpha equal 1. But if you listen to what I said in the previous lesson, then what happens to the Levy function, which is the one-sided Levy function, when alpha is equal half? It's a Gaussian, right? It's this strange Gaussian, which is half a Gaussian. So this Levy function, it's not a Levy function that is Gaussian, sorry. It's this inverse Levy function. This is the inverse of it. So the, the bottom line is that when alpha is equal 1, all this thing, this I leave you as an exercise. When alpha is equal 1, we regain, as expected, nothing surprising here, the Gaussian. So this al L alpha 2, 1, 1 was equal to, in, in let's say, t, it was this, uh, 4t, t to the minus 3 over 2, 
But then you take all this expression here and you multiply by this expression, you put an alpha equal one, then you get a Gaussian. So Px on T is a Gaussian when alpha is equal one, as you expect. When alpha is less than one, you get an interesting feature. PDF looks generically, let's say, alpha is equal half, something like this, like a tent. Because of this non-analytical behavior, because you see there's an absolute value here, the derivative here and the derivative there are not the same. This is a feature of this anomalous diffusion. There are some particles, what does this peak mean? It means that there are some particles that are moving so slowly that they are left behind and they create this non-analytical behavior around x equals zero. This is a specific feature that you can identify in this specific process, which is uh, something that you cannot guess from the start. I mean, I don't see how you guess it, but it simply means that there are some very slow particles and this creates some non-analytical behavior at small x. Of course, every finite measurement time so this is only in the limit of long times. So in the limit of long times, you get this cusp. So the, the shape of the PDF is very different than Gaussian. The scaling of x is very different than normal. But we have exact predictions how it works. And the most important issue is that Levy statistics is taking place. But it's not a trivial Levy statistics because at the beginning of the experience of people who Levy statistics are very basic. You have some NIOD random variables and these IOD random variables have let's say infinite variance. And then you add these symmetric random conversions. Here the Levy comes from what? From the time. So it's a sub-diffusive process. And the levy comes from the long tail trap, the usual levy function. It's the inverse levy function because, again, it's t over x, 2 to the alpha. x is downstairs. There's no fat tailed in x. This is perfectly normal in that sense, but the non-analytical non behavior comes up here. OK, so here we studied what I wanted to teach you on this uh, Continuous time random walk, uh, you showed again, we, we, you will see it again also in your homework, you saw it already. You need to be able to walk in Fourier Laplace space. If you don't do that, then everything here is going to be super complicated and impossible, I would say. Uh, we saw that we get universal laws, and what I'm going to do in the next two lessons, I'm going to present things uh, on the transparencies, I mean, on a as a talk and uh, not so much mathematics. So we will uh, discuss a little bit how this is in the lab and what are the consequences of this, especially in the context of ergodicity breaking, which is a relatively new field. But the bottom line is that when I started this, I didn't know anything about ergodicity breaking. Had I known, I would never start it, because I never believed that you can break ergodicity so easily. But all this is in violation, in some sense, in, of usual ergodic statistical mechanics. Uh, this brings you into many deep questions like, what is the ergodic properties of these systems? And these are very important when you look at single molecules, when you have time averages. And the bottom line is you essentially need to replace ergodic theory with something called weak ergodicity breaking. This is a concept that came from the uh, field of glass. The reason is rather simple and obvious, I would say. But if you have psi of tau, which decays like tau 1 plus alpha, as we said many times, the average tau is infinite. Now, ergodicity that people use in statistical physics means that you, you, you perform a time average in an experiment. And this time average, you, you, may, you need to make it long. But then the question is, long compared to what? In this case, it has to be compared to the average time. But the average time is infinite. So no matter how long you, you average over time, you don't go to any ensemble average because 
if this is infinity, your measurement time is always less than this. On the other hand, if this would be finite, then you could, if you are a good experimentalist, you could measure in principle for longer times. So this, this issue we will discuss next lesson, uh, uh, and it, has, it will bring you to the frontiers in some sense, uh, to many new interesting questions. So I'll see you next week.